Hi guys, I'm Ashley and today Christmas has hit this channel. I'm very excited about this. This is what my videos are going to look like throughout the entirety of December so uh, I hope you enjoy. <laughs> but before we go into full on Christmas and December mode, I need to wrap up November and I feel like this video might be a long one because I read 12 books which um, I did not expect. <laughs> in November I did also take part in the Believe in the Impossible Readathon or Believeathon for sure, which was hosted by my friend Gavin so I'll leave a link to his channel down below. So instead of just splitting this video into university reads and non-university reads this will actually be in three parts because I'm going to have university reads which I don't have many of and half of them were towards my dissertation so I do feel like some of you guys will enjoy that because it's Greek mythology. <laughs> The second section will be a Believeathon wrap up, and so all of those books will be children's books, and then the third section will just be the other books that I read during November. <laughs> so, starting with my university reads, the first book that I read I actually borrowed from my university library because I didn't want to go and buy it, but this one was The Country Girls by Edna O'Brien. This one essentially follows the lives of two teenage girls who live in Ireland and they're sent to a convent as their equivalent to a school but as they grow up and become kind of young women or just in their later teenage years they decide that they don't actually like this convent and come up with this plan to make it so they will be expelled and then they can go out into the world and live a very different kind of life. This is not a book that I would enjoy. I knew that from the offset because it is essentially just following these two girls living life and I say very often that I find it very boring reading about the everyday lives of everyday people. I'm very much a fantasy reader, I need magic and weird things happening. <laughs> I need books about taking down magical governments or monsters or anything like that to keep me entertained. So this book, not my kind of thing from the offset. However there was more to it that I found issue with than that because this is a very simply written book and that's not inherently a negative thing but there were certain things that kind of stemmed off that that became a negative thing in my opinion. So for instance it felt very fragmented because it would just jump around from one event to another and skip over everything in between. For example there was a part where within three pages a love interest came up out of nowhere and again within these three pages it turned from him not existing to him saying, you're the sweetest thing that ever happened to me. And I was just kind of like, excuse me? <laughs> and I'm not even exaggerating when I say three pages because it happened that quickly that I went back and counted. Because I was like, surely I've missed something here. No, nope, just it happened that quickly. <laughs> and things like that happened all the way through. So it would just kind of jump between events happening and didn't really have any kind of build up. It would just be like this happened and then this happened over here and then this happened over here and it was all very jumpy. I also just found that with it being so simply written and with it being a fairly short book there were quite a few topics or issues that were very vaguely touched upon but I wanted to see them go into a much deeper conversation about because there's this really strange relationship between the two main characters. So you have the main character and then her best friend. But her best friend is regularly really awful to her and I just could not wrap my head around how this dynamic works because in my opinion her friend wasn't a very good friend but then she's calling her a best friend and saying that she couldn't really do all these things without her and I just needed more to be able to understand how this is working because I didn't understand it at all. There were also instances of domestic abuse both in terms of wife and child and also depending how you read the situation possibly child grooming which does remind me I will have the trigger warnings for all of the books mentioned in this video down in the description box but things like that as I said they were only touched upon and they kind of happened and then ignored in a way. So I kind of wish that the book was a little bit longer or maybe just more concise in what it was telling us, I don't know. It just touched upon a lot of things, jumped around a lot and didn't really give me a full story it felt like. So I just didn't really enjoy this book. It wasn't awful, it was very readable, I will give it that much, it was very quick to read as well. But I ended up rating it 2 out of 5 stars. <laughs> The next book that I read for university was Longbourn by Joe Baker. This one is a historical fiction and it's actually a retelling of Pride and Prejudice but from the servant's point of view. Now the servant in this, or the main character servant, is Sarah. 
and it follows her perspective. She's very much one of the people who is constantly within the Bennett's household and she's very used to this one routine of working every day, going about her chores, but then that all gets kind of thrown off course because a new footman is introduced to the house. As you can probably expect with the synopsis hinting towards the sudden appearance of a man throwing everything off course, this does include a romance and you know what? I didn't hate it. I wasn't invested in it but I do feel like it was well written. It had quite a slow build up and it felt like an authentic build up as well. In terms of what this book is, because it's a retelling of Pride and Prejudice, I really enjoyed seeing this kind of behind the scenes view of what would be deemed as a quintessential English classic. Most people do know the story of Pride and Prejudice or if they don't they will know enough about the kind of classic stereotype to be able to know that that kind of book is a lot about appearances and what sort of social class you're in and all of those things are taken and put in this book but from a completely different perspective and it's just really really interesting because we have completely different conversations towards identity and how things like class affect their everyday lives because the things that the Bennett sisters might really dramatically respond to don't necessarily matter to the servants at all so it was really quite interesting to see it put into that perspective. There was a kind of random part in this where it detoured down into backstory territory and stayed there for a very long time and it felt like throughout this book because it is a 400 page book and it felt like for about 250 pages we were following the direct timeline of Pride and Prejudice like we were pretty much parallel with it the entire time and then we just took a complete detour into backstories and I just completely lost interest in that moment because we were following the story of Pride and Prejudice so closely and then we just suddenly weren't. And it wasn't just a slight detour, this went on for at least 50 pages and I was like, when are we going to get back to this story? Because while it was part of that story, it was this long ramble about one tiny detail and the reasoning behind why it was included and it definitely could have been done in a much shorter and concise way so didn't necessarily like that part of the story but for the most part really enjoyed reading this one and I did ultimately become invested in Sarah's story even though it's not usually the sort of thing that I've been picking up because it's historical fiction it's based off a classical book which I haven't been reading too much of the typical like Jane Austen, Bronte sister kind of classic but I don't know it kind of did remind me why I like reading those sorts of classics. Maybe not right now because I am straying away from classics now that I have to do them so thoroughly in university but my love for them is still there somewhere under the surface. It's just lying dormant for a while because uni has pulled out everything it can from that interest. <laughs> but yes I ended up racing this one at 3.5 out of 5 stars. Next up we go into dissertation reading and this one is The Penelope Ad by Margaret Atwood. I know that so many of you guys have been waiting for me to read this book because every single time I mention Greek mythology retellings somebody in the comments is like, have you read The Penelope Ad? I have now read The Penelope Ad. So this one is probably one of the most famous Greek myth retellings and it follows Penelope who is Odysseus' wife from the Odyssey. The Odyssey being the story of Odysseus going missing for 20 years so as you can imagine following his wife Penelope we're now reading her point of view. While Odysseus has gone missing during all this time she's fending off suitors like hundreds and hundreds of suitors who are trying to take her home or basically ransacking her house and also raise a child who is going to be the heir of this place that's being ransacked so um so she wasn't having the best time and Margaret Atwood decided to tell her story or a version of her story. So like Longbourn this one kind of felt like a behind the scenes of an original story because as I said this one is the Odyssey but what was happening back home while all that was going on. So I found that really interesting because you hear about all these stories and these heroic adventures and whatnot but then what happens to the people back home? Why is it the heroes that are deemed the heroes whereas the people who are left back home to deal with everything and to go through the suffering of grief and all these different things, why are they not considered at all? Penelope is also a figure who is very often made into a symbol for like the wife to be. She is everybody's wife goals because she is the most loyal wife, she is absolutely dedicated, she did not stray away from Odysseus at all even though he was gone for 20 years. So reading a perspective that is from her point of view was really quite fascinating because it made her human again. One thing I really loved noticing in this book is that as time goes on and as years pass on and as more and more rumours pass about how Odysseus is sleeping around with other people, 
her anger levels just rise and rise and rise and she just gets so impatient with all of the rumours, all of the people bothering her during this entire time and that is completely justified and valid and it's just one of those things that, I don't know, I kind of just really love reading about angry women in Greek mythology <laughs> so <laughs> and this is why I love Greek myth retelling so much because so many authors nowadays are showing women's anger because they're literally not given a voice and the most awful things could happen to them and it's just like that's the way of the world what a shame <laughs> i didn't love the sections about the 12 maids because there is a thing that happens towards the end of the odyssey with 12 maids but i feel like those chapters needed something more i'm not sure what but they are presented as a kind of chorus as they would have been in the odyssey it didn't really hit me on any kind of level, it just kind of felt like women shouting, which is fine. But because their chapters were so short and snappy compared to Penelope's, it just got lost somewhere, so I I don't know. Maybe that's the point, because I have read articles about how this is meant to be given the voices to the 12 maids as well, but then Penelope's is completely overpowering that. What I did particularly love about this book is just the ambiguity and the unreliability to it, because all the way through this book, Penelope is saying that this is the true story. This is what actually happened while all the heroic myth of the Odyssey was happening. Penelope also quite often takes pride in how she's tricking everybody. One of the things she's most famous for is her weaving trick and so she takes pride in that. She takes pride in how she's tricked all these people, how she's consistently done so. But then what does that mean for our reading experience when our narrator is claiming this is the truth while also taking pride in her lies? I just found that really interesting to think about while I was reading it and I found that the ambiguity was really quite... It was a really good thing to include because that same ambiguity is included in the Odyssey. A lot of that is about trickery and who to trust and all that kind of thing. So yeah, it was one of the things I'm very glad that Mog Atwood took from the Odyssey and included in this as well because trickery and wordplay is one of the most inherent things in the Odyssey. So how many times can I say Odyssey? in this video. I'm not even done yet because just wait and see. Wait and see guys. <laughs> but I rated this one at 4 out of 5 stars. Are you ready for it? Are you ready? The Odyssey <laughs> by Homer, translated by Emily Wilson. This was a reread for me. This is one of my favourite books but I hadn't read this translation before. As I said before, this is the story of Odysseus struggling to get home. He goes to fight in the Trojan War, majorly pisses off Poseidon and so it takes him another 10 years to get back home. On the way he stops at many different islands and on every single island is a different kind of trial, a lot of those trials being things like women. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's one of my favourite stories. This is... I always say that if you want to start off a Greek mythology then this is the place to be because it's essentially just a fantasy book. In this book you have monsters, you have gods, you have witches, you have blatant insults which I found really really amusing to read about and especially if you're just starting out and you're kind of daunted by the whole ancient classic stereotype of it being very like prestigious and academic this is a great place to start because Emily Wilson in her introduction and translator's note specifically makes a point that there's absolutely no reason for us to translate things in a more prestigious or difficult form of English compared to what we speak now because that more difficult form of English is no closer to ancient Greek than how I'm talking to you now. So there's no reason to just not translate it as we would say it. With this translation she also worked to remove gender assumptions, so things like slaves being called whores when there was no actual blatant evidence of that things like that have been included in previous translations and she worked to kind of get rid of that. So I do just think that this is a brilliant translation of the Odyssey, as far as I can tell, anyway. I obviously don't know ancient Greek and cannot translate it myself to compare, but I have read another translation. I enjoyed that just as much, but this one is written in the original format of a poem. But it makes sense, you know? That's, that's all we want from a book. I'll read out the first stanza so that you can see what I mean with it being understandable. Tell me about a complicated man. Muse, tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had wrecked the holy town of Troy, and where he went and who he met, the pain he suffered on sea, and how he worked to save his life and bring his men back home. He failed, and for their own mistakes they died. They ate the sun god's cattle, and the god kept them from home. Now goddess, child of Zeus, tell the old story for our modern times. Find the beginning. 
So yes, as I said, it is fairly easy to follow and despite it being quite a chunky book, it's quite quick to get through and I would also recommend the audiobook if you can get hold of it, so yeah. Really enjoy my reread of this, it's full of annotations, would definitely reread again, will probably reread again. <laughs> And I rated this one at 5 out of 5 stars. So then we move on to the Believeathon books. I read 5 books for Believeathon. They weren't the books that I had on my TBR to begin with. Some of them were, but some of them I did kind of swap out. But the first of those books was The House with Chicken Legs by Sophie Anderson. This one is inspired by Slavic folklore and the story of Baba Yaga. It follows a girl called Marenka whose grandmother is Baba Yaga, so she works to kind of help the dead go through the door and pass into the beyond. Now it's said that Marinka's destiny is to follow her grandmother's footsteps and become the next Yaga, taking over this job and helping guide the dead. But Marinka doesn't want to do that. All she wants is to be human. She wants to have a settled life and make friends, but that's kind of hard for her to do because her house has chicken legs and just gets up and moves. So she can't really make friends. It's kind of a difficult endeavor to do when you're always moving. <laughs> I really enjoyed this book. I kind of predicted that I would because it is based off folklore and that's just, that's my jam. <laughs> I did find that it got a little bit too repetitive for my liking, which was kind of expected with children's books because they do really like, they remind their audience of what's going on. But because the main crux of this story is Marinka just wanting a friend and not wanting to take on the Yaga life, that is repeated so often within this book and it was kind of this book was sitting around 3.5 stars for me it was enjoyable and really quite charming i really liked the dynamic of the house in particular because as i said this house gets up and moves but it was so much more than that as well because the house kind of reacted to marinka it really was as if the house had feelings whereas i thought it was just going to be the house can move and that's the extent of that <laughs> So that kind of took me by surprise and it took me a while to get used to because I was like picturing a house just getting up and moving of its own accord it's not something I can imagine easily like just imagine sitting in your bedroom and then just suddenly going flying across the room because your house has decided it wants to go and sit on a mountain somewhere like <laughs> what? It really did work and it's not something I can never say that I've come across before in my life but I really enjoyed reading about that because it was so much more than I expected and come the end of this book in particular I ended up boosting the rating to four out of five stars particularly because of how the last 100 pages or so handles grief. All I can really say is I've personally never come across many books that write grief as I've experienced it or write it well. I feel like this book does it really quite well especially for the audience as well and it just hit me in some kind of way that I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> I was enjoying this book, but now this book's making me have emotions and did not expect that. So, as I said, I did end up bumping up the rating and rated it four out of five stars. <laughs> oh, and this was also for the prompt to read a book that is inspired by mythology or folklore. Next up, I read Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. This one is... It's a children's classic. It was for the prompt to read a children's classic and it's so children's classic-y. <laughs> Basically, I think there's a very specific feel surrounding children's classics, especially some of the older ones like this because this very much reminded me of The Secret Garden, for instance. There's just something about this kind of story that's somewhat quaint but has a very moralistic tone to the story. So. The story itself basically just follows a group of sisters. So their father goes away to fight in the war and so it starts on a Christmas and it's their first Christmas without their father around. And in the beginning, they're kind of talking about what they're aiming to do within that next year and what they're hoping to achieve while their father's gone so that he can come home and they can be like, here's how things happen back home. The book then just follows that year and them living their lives, but it's very much the sort of story which has a moral to the story in every single chapter. So the basic layout of this book would be every single chapter would have an event happen to one of the sisters. Something would go wrong. It would be okay. And in the final kind of page or paragraph, their mother or I don't know, someone else would come along and say, this is why we don't do this. Or this is why we aim to do this instead because we want to be good girls. It, it was quite charming to begin with but <laughs> I became really quite tired of it. It's almost too long a book to be able to do that 
in every single chapter. It was really quite tedious. There is some weird kind of charm to children's classics and I did find myself interested in where all the sisters would end up because it very much fell into the thing, this is another thing of children's classics as well, it very much fell into the case of every character because there were four sisters. So each of those four sisters had a very distinctive trait that it would stick to and that is how you'd kind of tell them apart. So in that sense they were flat characters because they only really had one or two traits given to them. But I do admit that I did like reading about how these traits would clash or come together, how these sisters were getting along and how that would change through the course of the year. I did find it quite interesting in that way but it was, as I said, quite a tedious book come the end so I ended up writing this one two out of five stars. <laughs> no I didn't, I wrote it three out of five stars. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about the next one for too long because it is just it's a typical one. But I read the illustrated Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. This one was for the prompt to read a book with magic in it, for obvious reasons, and um, yeah, it's Goblet of Fire. I don't particularly... well, I do like it but it's my least favourite of the series, just because I feel like this takes a really sudden turn, almost too sudden a turn, because the first three books are very much just a cycle of the trio surviving Hogwarts for a year and, you know, finding out a little bit more every single year. However, they then reach fourth year and that just gets thrown completely out of the window. The trio are not a thing, or they are, but like, not for a large part of the book. There's a tribe as a tournament, the world is expanded beyond Hogwarts and goes quite literally worldwide. You also find out a lot more about the government and who works there and it's just a hell of a lot of information really suddenly thrown on you. And I love the fact that the world has expanded like that but I just feel like it was all or nothing. <laughs> so I don't know. I also just despise Quidditch and a lot of this book, especially the start of it, is about Quidditch so um, it takes a lot for me to get through it. It takes a lot for me to get through it. But as much as this is my least favourite from the series I cannot deny that this is the book where you start seeing the complexity of the story come together because that is essentially one of my favourite parts about the series. Just all the tiny details and ties that come together to link every part of the story and how clever the entire plotline is. It comes with a lot of annoyances. I find everything in this book annoying <laughs> but yeah. It's Harry Potter, of course I love it anyway. I do wish that there were more illustrations in this because they were of course my favourite part of it, that's why I got the illustrated edition, but overall I rated it 4 out of 5 stars. <laughs> I then picked up A North Child by Edith Patu. This one is about a girl called Rose who was born first in North and that means she's quite the adventurous child. So her mother actually wanted enough children to be able to kind of have a child for every single part of the compass because she's very superstitious and she believed that every direction had a different kind of trait for a child but then it was predestined that if she ever had a North child that child would die on an adventure of some sort. So she is adamant that she's not having a North child but then lo and behold Rose comes along. Now it does say on the back that when Rose grows a bit older she does end up going on an adventure, she rides away on the back of Giant White Bear and that is a whole story there. So I was pleasantly surprised about this book because I did not expect the amount of Norse mythology references that are in this. I also didn't expect it to be quite so fairy tale-esque because I could see so many ties to fairy tales in this. Like I saw Beauty and the Beast in this book, I saw the Snow Queen in this book. There were so many stories being told within this book. <laughs> And I really, really loved that because linking in with the superstitions and then all these folklore ties and mythologies, I just, oh, I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> Weirdly though, it did prove to be one of its downfalls because with the fairy tales that I could see in the story, I kind of predicted how the ending might happen and I was really not too impressed when it did follow that out because, mainly because of the age of the character. Um, I suppose if I say like the fairy tale happy ever after moment, it was a bit awkward when I just read about this child character. <sighs> I don't know, it was weird. I didn't want it, basically. <laughs> I also don't think that all of the characters were necessary, so there's quite a few character perspectives written. Oh my god, let me think what characters have perspectives. So Rose had a perspective, the white bear did, the troll queen. Neddy, her brother, and I think her father did as well, or maybe it was just her brother. 
Oh no, her father did as well. So there were quite a lot of perspectives and I don't think all of them were necessary. More specifically her brother. I think her brother's chapters could have been taken out without any real detriment to the story. It was just one of those situations where the same story was being told multiple times from multiple perspectives which did build a broader kind of story. But because, for instance, her father and her brother would be in the same household, there wasn't too much difference between their storylines, so it wasn't entirely necessary. But I did really enjoy this book and I ended up rating it... Through, what did I rate it? I rated it 3.5 out of 5 stars. <laughs> and this one suited the prompts to read a seasonal book and also to read a book with an animal character. The final book that I read for believe -a was, of course, Frostheart by Jamie Littler. This one is just... <laughs> Things happened with this book, okay? So, I have been saying, probably for over a month, in many different videos, that I wasn't sure about this book because I didn't think it would be for me. I, I, I'm not sure why, I kind of just had this idea when I read the synopsis and I saw the cover that this one would have struggled to kind of cross that bridge between me enjoying it as an adult versus me enjoying it as a child. So, I wasn't sure about this book but then I got FOMO and decided to read it anyway because it's the group book, everybody was talking about it so I also wanted to see what everybody was talking about. And I am so glad that I did because this ended up being my favourite read of Believeathon. I am shook, like <laughs> I could not be more surprised. So this one follows a boy called Ash whose parents disappeared when he was younger and he was kind of taken in by the community that he lives in. This community lives in raised platforms in a kind of snowy area and their houses and structures are built up on these rocks and on these wooden platforms so that they cannot touch the snow because they believe that if they touch the snow then the monsters that live underneath it will be able to sense that and will come out to fight and obviously cause absolute havoc. But these monsters communicate through song and so singing is banished. If you do sing then you're very much seen as having an association with the monsters and so you just don't do it. You don't do it guys. <laughs> but of course one of the only things that Ash can remember about his parents is a lullaby that he sung to him and so he always has this intense need to sing. He just gets this urge every so often to sing and it happens quite often when the monsters come out of the ground. So every so often he just slip up and he just sing. Everybody kind of shuns him for this and sees him as an outcast. They don't want him as part of this community but of course he doesn't have parents so what are they going to do with him? But then one day there's an accident and his powers are actually revealed to the world and it just so happens that a band of people who are going exploring on this snow sleigh happen to need his help and so he's whisked away onto the frost tower and he goes in search of his parents. I feel like that was such a rambly synopsis. I'm, I apologise if you didn't get any of that. <laughs> You cannot help but love it because the main character, Ash, is such a cinnamon roll of a main character that you just have to root for him. Like, he is so pure and small and just needs all the kindness in the world and didn't get any of it. <laughs> you can't help but root for him. Like, look at him. He's so small. Especially when you have illustrations all the way throughout. Like, the illustrations for this completely won me over. It was... It really added something else to the story and I think it works particularly well because Jamie Littler himself drew them so it's very much how he imagined them like there's no miscommunication here this is Jamie Littler's story and it's just such a charming story like it's so fun to read the cast of characters in this make it so fun and I really do particularly love the fact that singing is the magic power in this there's just something about that that wins my heart over every time because I love singing and oh I don't know I just feel like there's so much to this book that I enjoyed and I really loved talking about it during the live show that Gavin hosted. So yeah, this took me by surprise completely. I ended up rating it 4.5 out of 5 stars. And we're still not quite done because I read another three books that were just there in no particular reason. So the first one was My Sister the Serial Killer by a Yinkan Braithwaite. This one I read on script, it felt like ages ago, but I think that's because I genuinely just did not No level of interest was captured with me in this book. So it's a relatively short book, it's only 200 pages long and each page is quite fragmented. The the level of text on each page was very varied. It could go from three sentences to a full page. None of them really went more than that. They were all very short snippets. So this story follows a woman who, I think three times in a row now, has been called by her sister to help get rid of her husband's body, or her boyfriend's body, 
I don't think she ever marries any of them, so. I think this is the third time this happens, and so this woman is kind of like, is my sister a serial killer? Because this is happening a bit too often and this whole self-defense thing doesn't really stand the test anymore. Like, what's going on is essentially what the book is about. She's kind of debating what to do about this, like where her moral stands. She wants to stand by her sister, but also possibly a murderer. What do you do about that? This book is basically 200 pages of conflict. Like, it's just the sisters bickering. It's the relationship between them two and what it means, where your morality stands when you're in defense of a family member. I really cannot explain why I didn't have any interest in this book. I thought it would be really interesting. I thought that this dynamic would really capture my attention because I feel like if it was that kind of thing in a fantasy book I'd be sat there like wow that's a really difficult situation how are we going to get through this whereas I was reading this and just didn't care don't have a clue why cannot I just I can't pinpoint it <laughs> it's really frustrating me I've been thinking about this all month but to me it did essentially just feel like 200 pages of sisters bickering I did like feeling the anger rise like I feel like it did a really good job at building up the frustration of the main character because there would be the initial like she's helping her sister out from this really dramatic event trying to deal with the guilty feeling that's following her around and the sense of suspicion that she feels from other people but then tiny events would happen in their day-to-day -day life which would build and build and build until eventually like you know you felt the frustration and I feel like it did a really good job at showing that other than that though couldn't really say I was all that interested so um I was really surprised by that because I thought a 200 page book that's kind of like a murder mystery would have no problem doing that but um I was wrong <laughs> so I rated this one two out of five stars next up I read Ninth House by Lee Bardugo this took me forever to read absolutely forever I think it took me about three weeks four weeks I don't know it was in many reading vlogs <laughs> This follows a girl called Alex Stern who is one day part of a very horrific crime. Everybody dies besides her. But when she wakes up in hospital, she's actually met by a person who offers her a full grant and a full scholarship to Yale University because she can actually see ghosts. And this is very much a sought out thing for the society that hires her. So she becomes part of the Ninth House, which is a secret society that is almost like a warden for the other secret societies. So at Yale University there's a lot of secret societies that kind of dabble in occult magic and there needs to be some kind of border between what's okay and what's not. The Ninth House includes the people who watch over that. So because she can see ghosts and because she has this ability and this connection to the dead, Alex is brought into this and, you know, becomes part of all this occult stuff. Not too long after Alex starts at this university, there is actually a murder of a young girl. But it seems to Alex that everybody is kind of brushing this murder under the carpet. They're not really looking too far into the investigation. They kind of just threw down the most obvious answer and then left it at that. But Alex believes there's something more to this murder and so she starts digging. This is essentially a dark academia kind of book with two mysteries going on along the plot line. There's ghosts, all that fun stuff. I had high expectations for this. I really enjoy the Dark Academia atmosphere and I do feel like Leah Bardugo did a really particularly good job of capturing that. As I said, there are two mysteries that run throughout this book. To me, it felt like both of them ended up a little bit too long-winded for my liking. They were both pulled out too far and just carried on for too long. It took an awfully long time to get anywhere with either of them and then the links that were made between them were just a bit... I don't know, it was kind of like, why? <laughs> I think it's that sense of, I don't get it, which carries on as well, because my other main problem with this was the believability of the characters. In other words, I didn't believe any of the characters at all. Like, their personalities were basically built through us being told what they're like and how other people see them. I don't feel like we discovered the characters, I feel like we were told what they were like but for some reason my perception didn't add up to what I was being told and so when we'd read a scene and they'd react to something I wouldn't believe what they were doing because I was like I don't... I feel like I... I don't, it's a really difficult thing to explain because I've never come across this before like I've never just straight up not believed that a character would do something so my main thing is that Alex, the main character, she is constantly 
thinking in her brain that she's much more dangerous than she is. She would kind of talk about how people don't realise how dark she could be and that she has this history inside her and that she can be that person. But it was never acted on. It took an awfully long time to actually get to the backstory that would stem this kind of thinking. But then we'd suddenly have a scene where this previously quite reserved character would just punch her hand through a load of glass and I'm like... Why? <laughs> I don't know what happened because usually I personally think Leo Bardugo is pretty good at making up characters like Six of Crows is great in terms of characters so I just don't understand what happened. I'm <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> that did ultimately let it down for me because I just couldn't believe anything that was happening. So I ended up rating this one 3 out of 5 stars because I did enjoy this story to some extent and I do really like Dark Academia atmosphere but eh. <laughs> I don't know. It was a weird one. So then the final book that I read I feel like has kind of some of the same issues because this one was Prince of Thorns by Mark Lawrence. Again, this one took me quite a while to read. This one follows a prince called Jorg who runs away from the castle and ends up leading a band of criminals because he is kind of on the hunt for revenge. So when he was younger, when he was 10 years old, he witnessed his mother and his brother being murdered by a count in the neighbouring country. And since that day, he has been absolutely set on revenge. He has sworn that he's going to find this count who killed off his mother and brother and he's going to kill him in return. I'm not going to say much more than that, as vague as that sounds, because I really struggle to see what goes into spoiler territory because this book takes so long to get anywhere that you are 100 pages in and nothing really happens, or rather just the same old thing happens because this book starts really really violent. It is a very violent book. There are many trigger warnings so um look at the description box. <laughs> so the first 100 pages are just this boy going around ransacking places, killing everyone, having a delightful time with it apparently and it's really not until about halfway in that things actually start happening so I don't know where to draw the line between what's a spoiler and what's not because there's not too much for me to tell you about the beginning but then if I tell you anything more than that you I've spoiled like half the book. So as I said I was reading this one for quite a while and it is a pretty recent read so if you've seen any of my recent reading vlogs then you probably know that my main issue with this was the age of the main character because as I said this is a prince but I have also called him a boy because when we start out, he's 14 years old. He does turn 15 during the course of the book and I just didn't believe that this was a thing because the way he was talking, the way he was acting, I had to, well, I would have aged him up in my head if the book allowed me to forget about his age, but it didn't. <laughs> but I just did not believe that a boy at 15 years old could lead a band of criminals and apparently be so hell-bent on revenge that he is completely undefeatable purely out of ruthlessness because this boy didn't have any kind of training with a sword but apparently he's just so hell-bent on revenge and just does not give a damn that he can go around killing everybody and no one will ever be able to stop him and I was like I feel like there's a flaw there <laughs> this is essentially an absolutely awful book like the it's just violence. It's pure utter violence. It's really gory. It doesn't shy away from the details. But if you're not bothered about a violent, somewhat gritty fantasy book, I'm not particularly bothered about it. So I read it. I was like, that's not my problem. It's the fact that a 15 year old who has had zero training in anything to do with murder is apparently doing all this. Just no, no, no. <laughs> also, it's a fantasy book, but there's like barely any fantasy things until the last 100 pages and then it's like because <laughs> that was another thing as well there were quite a few different fantasy elements but they were kind of just thrown in at random and introduced really suddenly so I think as a whole this book just had very little reasoning behind anything it did so there was no reason behind like why different elements of fantasy things would pop up like necromancers popped up out of nowhere and then there was like a spirit in a wall and I was just like I don't really understand what's going on because there's no real ties between everything. It was almost like there was a lot of ideas and not quite enough links between them. So I didn't hate this book like I did keep reading it and there was something that kept me reading. I think it was the tone of the writing because it almost reminded me of Nevernight in that it had the very blunt approach. It was somewhat sarcastic but 
it wasn't it was nowhere near as good as Nevernight. But it did keep me reading. So I ended up rating this one three out of five stars, but I don't think I will be continuing the series. I might try out other books from Mark Lawrence because I think those ones will both interest me more and hopefully <laughs> have more reason and understanding behind it. But um I just, I'm just baffled. Absolutely and completely baffled. So these are not quite all of the books that I read in November because there were one that I borrowed, two on Scribd, and then Harry Potter which I haven't picked up. So um, I've done four more books to this pile and these are all the books that I read in November. <laughs> it was a weird month for reading. I think that's the best I can say for that. If you've read any of these books then please do let me know your thoughts on them. I feel like I had many thoughts on many books so um, help me stretch them out and actually make sense of them please. <laughs> But for now, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then remember to leave a like and a comment to let me know that you're here. If you're not subscribed already, then please consider doing that. Down in the description box, you'll find all the information to the books I've mentioned in this video, all of my social media and some bookish free trials as well. So be sure to go and look at that if you haven't already. But for now, I hope you're having a lovely day and I shall see you next time with a new video. Bye.